ready to become a negotiation ninja. Today we're uh, deep diving into the art of negotiation, but not in the way you might think. Yeah, we're ditching those aggressive tactics and pulling out a surprising secret weapon, empathy. It's about changing the game entirely. Instead of that winner takes all mentality, we're exploring how understanding the other person's needs can actually lead to better outcomes for everyone. We're cracking open chapter 19 negotiation from Scott Howard Swain's book, A Practical Empath. Get this, Swain cut his teeth in the high pressure world of dot, wait for it, used car sales. Talk about a crash course in reading people. <laughs> and it was there he picked up some unconventional tactics like the power of strategic silence. Okay, strategic silence. You've got to be kidding me. I'm the queen of awkward silences, usually the kinds I create by accident. Right. But Swain found that after presenting an offer, the next person to speak often loses their advantage. So I should channel my inner mime. Just like stand there silently. Think of it as a power move disguised as politeness. That silence can feel heavy, but it doesn't shut the door. It gives the other person space to really think about what you've said. See, I would have thought that silence equals anger or a lost cause. It's fascinating how our gut reactions to these things can be so off. Swain also talks about offering choices instead of ultimatums. He actually gives an example from his car selling days. Instead of hitting people with take it or leave it, he was trained to lay out different loan options. Instead of a yes-no situation, it became about picking the best choice from a menu. Subtle, but genius. You're shifting the whole dynamic. Suddenly, the other person feels empowered. They're not just being told what to do. They're part of the process. Exactly. And that sense of control, even if it's just choosing between option A and option B, can make all the difference. People are more likely to agree to something when they feel like they had a say in it. This is already making me rethink how I approach negotiation. It's not about wielding power. It's about understanding the needs and motivations on both sides. Absolutely. And Swain breaks this down even further by distinguishing between two main types of negotiation. He calls them energy materials negotiation and idea negotiation. Okay, so energy materials negotiation, that sounds tangible. Like, are we splitting a pizza or a billion dollar company? Exactly. Salary talks, deciding on chores, even haggling over the price of something at a flea market. It all falls under that category. Basically, any time there's a transaction happening, yeah. I give you this, you give me that. Precisely. Now, idea negotiation is a different beast altogether. It's less about stuff and more about finding common ground. So like those brainstorming sessions where everyone has a different vision for a project or even Dare I say it, family discussions about where to go on vacation. Exactly. Resolving disagreements, brainstorming solutions, even those heated political debates, it's about bridging different perspectives. And that actually makes a lot of sense. But how do you apply empathy when you're debating ideas? It seems trickier than, say, figuring out who gets the last slice of pizza. It requires a deeper level of listening. Swain talks about really tuning into the why behind someone's perspective. Are they motivated by fairness? Efficiency, a desire to be heard. So it's less about arguing your point and more about uncovering what's driving their argument. Exactly. You're getting to the heart of their values. And often, once you understand their why, you can start to bridge the gap and find solutions that speak to those deeper needs. So you're not just negotiating the what anymore. You're negotiating the underlying values and motivations driving the what. Now, that's what I call next level negotiation. And what's fascinating is that Swain argues this approach can lead to more creative and lasting solutions. It's not just about getting your way, it's about finding a way that feels like a win for everyone involved. Okay, but hold on a second. All of this sounds great in theory, but what about those of us who, well, kind of dread negotiation? Yeah. You know, the ones who would rather fight a thousand bees than ask for a raise. You're definitely not alone. A lot of people feel uncomfortable with negotiation, but Swain reminds us to have empathy for ourselves first. Empathy for our own dread. It's an interesting way to look at it. He says we often shy away from negotiation because we're afraid of coming across as pushy, damaging relationships, or maybe we're just not sure of our own worth. Oh, wow. That really hits home. I've definitely let those fears sabotage me in the past. I either clam up completely or come on way too strong. It's about recognizing those feelings and figuring out the needs behind them. What does fairness look like to you in this situation? What boundaries do you need to set to feel respected? So it's like prepping for a negotiation by negotiating with myself first getting clear on my own needs and motivations. Exactly, because when you know your own why, you can approach the conversation with more confidence and clarity. Okay, so let's say I've done my homework, I've tapped into my inner Yoda and embraced the power of empathy. But how do I actually put this into practice during a negotiation? Like, what are the magic words? Well, Swain provides some really insightful examples in the book demonstrating how to weave empathy into the conversation without sounding like a broken record. 
He actually includes sample dialogues. <laughs> Do you want to try one out? Oh, I love a good role play. Let's bring this empathy thing to life. All right. How about we tackle the ongoing debate about remote work versus office work? Imagine you're Taylor, a passionate defender of working from home, and I'm Alex, who thrives on those in-person interactions. Ooh, this is going to be good. Yeah. Okay, I'm channeling my inner Taylor, ready to extol the virtues of working in my pajamas. Hit me with your best shot, Alex. All right, Taylor, buckle up. Remote work is the future. It cuts costs, boosts flexibility, and leads to happier employees. What's not to love? Hold on there, Alex. You're talking about cutting costs and boosting flexibility. But what about the human connection? Don't you miss those spontaneous brainstorming sessions? You know, by the water cooler, the camaraderie of a shared workspace. You bring up a really important point, Taylor. It sounds like you're concerned about the potential impact on teamwork and those serendipitous moments that happen when people are together. Exactly. It's not just about spreadsheets and deadlines. It's about the energy we create when we're working side by side. So for you, it's about preserving those creative sparks yeah. and that sense of community a shared workspace can foster. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just about work either. Remember when we were kids and we'd spend hours exploring the woods behind our houses, building forts and creating our own worlds. Mm -hmm. Those were formative experiences, learning to collaborate and problem solve in the real world. You're drawing a fascinating parallel, Taylor. It seems like you believe there's something irreplaceable about face-to-face -face interactions, that we miss out on crucial developmental experiences when we're confined to the digital realm. You know, Alex, you really get it. I'm not against remote work entirely. It has its perks. I love being able to whip up a gourmet lunch between meetings or squeeze in a quick bike ride to clear my head. <laughs> and don't even get me started on avoiding rush hour traffic. So you appreciate the flexibility and autonomy that remote work allows, but you also value those in-person connections and the shared energy of a physical workspace. Exactly. It's like I'm straddling two worlds, seeing the value in both. Maybe there's a middle ground here, a way to honor both sets of needs. What if, instead of going all in on remote work, we explored a hybrid model, something that offers the best of both worlds? That's an interesting thought, Taylor. A hybrid model could potentially provide the flexibility and autonomy that some employees crave while still nurturing those vital in-person connections. See, we didn't even have to wrestle each other to the ground to reach a compromise. Yeah. But seriously, Alex, that was amazing. By actually listening to each other's perspectives. And I mean, really listening to the why behind the what. We move from this place of opposition to a potential solution that could work for everyone. And that's the beauty of empathy in action. It's not about one person conceding defeat, it's about uncovering shared values and finding creative ways to honor them. This deep dive is blowing my mind. Who knew that empathy could be such a powerful tool, not just in our personal lives, but in the boardroom as well? It's about shifting from a transactional mindset to a transformative one. Instead of viewing negotiation as a battle to be won, we can approach it as an opportunity to build understanding foster collaboration, and create solutions that work for everyone involved. Speaking of solutions, I'm dying to know more about Swain's tips for actually weaving empathy into a negotiation. What are some concrete techniques we can use to make it feel less awkward and more authentic? Well, Swain outlines a framework that he calls the four pillars of empathetic negotiation. It's all about shifting your mindset from me versus you to we're in this together. And it starts with mastering the art of... The four pillars of empathetic negotiation. It sounds almost spiritual. Tell me more. It's about building a foundation of trust and mutual understanding. The first pillar is all about active listening. Okay, active listening. That sounds pretty straightforward. But how is it different from just, you know, hearing what someone has to say? It's about going beyond just the words themselves and tuning into the emotions and needs beneath the surface. It's about putting yourself in their shoes and trying to see the situation from their perspective. So it's not just about waiting for your turn to speak but really absorbing what they're saying, yeah. both verbally and non-verbally. Exactly. Pay attention to their tone of voice, their body language. Yeah. What's the underlying message they're trying to convey? This is making me realize how often I'm guilty of just planning my next brilliant retort instead of truly listening. It's a common trap. But when you actively listen, you create space for understanding and empathy to emerge. And that leads us to the second pillar, acknowledgement. Okay, acknowledgement. Does that mean agreeing with everything they say, even if I don't? Not necessarily. It's about recognizing the validity of their feelings and experiences, even if you don't share their perspective. It's about saying, I hear you. I understand where you're coming from. So it's like you're validating their emotions without necessarily endorsing their stance. Exactly. It's amazing how disarming it can be to simply feel heard and understood. It diffuses tension and opens the door for more productive dialogue. This is really making me rethink my approach to conflict in general. It's not about winning or losing, but about finding common ground. Which brings us to the third pillar, 
Identifying shared needs. Shared needs. But what if the other person seems like my polar opposite? Like, we want completely different things. Even in seemingly opposed positions, there are almost always underlying shared needs. For example, both Taylor and Alex in our role play value connection and productivity. Their approaches might differ, but the core need is the same. So it's about digging beneath the surface to uncover those points of commonality. Exactly. Once you've identified those shared needs, you can start brainstorming creative solutions that address them. And that's the fourth and final pillar, collaborative problem solving. So instead of each person clinging to their side, you're working together to find a solution that works for everyone. Exactly. It's about tapping into that we're in this together mentality and brainstorming solutions that address the needs of both parties. This whole Four Pillars framework is brilliant. It's like you've given me a secret decoder ring for navigating conflict with more empathy and understanding. Mm -hmm. I feel equipped to tackle even the most challenging negotiations. Remember, it's not about memorizing a script or manipulating the other person. It's about approaching the conversation with genuine curiosity, a willingness to listen, and a desire to find solutions that work for everyone involved. This deep dive has been a game changer. It's amazing how a simple shift in mindset can transform the way we approach negotiation and conflict. And for me, I think that's what I'm going to take away from this deep dive. It's not about being ruthless or cutthroat. It's about leading with empathy and understanding. Absolutely. And, you know, the applications of this go far beyond just those formal negotiation settings. You're right, because whether we're navigating a salary negotiation or just trying to decide what to have for dinner, these principles can help us build stronger relationships and create win-win outcomes. And on that note, I think it's time for us to wrap up this deep dive. 